Well, I apologize. I, uh, I, don't, I don't really don't know if this is a thing or not, but I drive a lot back and forth between Christ and Moab. We covered a few counties and last week. started off in Christ, and I had a, it felt good, but by the time I got to Moab, I don't know if it's the weather change. I don't know. If, I really don't know if that's a thing. You hear it a lot, but the weather change got me. I can't talk very well. But I did anticipate Johnny going long, so mine's going to be short when we get on my news. Um, so, I, I think a, a really important element of uh, working with health departments and understanding kind of our perspective is, is just understanding the makeup of the public health network in Utah. Um, it, it consists of uh, 13 separate local health departments, six of which um, kind of you look right through the middle and southern part of the, part of the state are multi-county entities. Seven of them, seven, seven of them are um, associated directly with the county. Um, for those multi-county en entities such as Southeast Utah, we operate under an inter interlocal agreement with each county, um, the Board of Health that governs us. But we can, we can uh, make our own policies and rules and um, and we govern ourselves under the direction of the board. Um, the single county health departments work in conjunction with the, the, the county function. And I haven't worked there as much, so it, um, I don't know as much, or I haven't worked there at all, so I don't know as much about their operation and how it fits in with um, the county government, but um, you know they're operating under their budget, their elected officials and, and everything like that. Um, but um, a lot of people, I mean, we get a lot of questions about what we are, who we are. Uh, they think we are the state health department, um, and, and we're not. Um, we don't operate under the state health department. We get questions about are we a branch of the CDC, and of course we're not that um, <coughs> Let's see. The state health department, their, their role as far as, as local public health is concerned is they write a lot of rules and um, those rules apply to us until such time as, as a local health department decides to, to pass their own uh, regulation. And as, as we know in Utah, if you're going to pass a regulation stricter than whatever the state passes, then you have to have uh, justification for that. But so we, we do operate under state uh, rules and regulations, but not under their, their organization. Um, we do work pretty well together. We regularly meet um, at these your health officers or your environmental health directors or nursing. We're, we're meeting. We, we do our best to try to unify our approach to, to different topics whether we're talking about fairs and temporary meth gatherings or food trucks or immunization policy, whatever it may be. But every health department feels like they they usually need to make some tweaks to, to, to suit their population. And so as we talk today, um, you may see some things that your county does a little bit differently um, than the way I've approached it. But generally, we, we try to, and, and lately that effort has increased in trying to conform to processes and, um, to make it easier for the people that we're working with. And then within the health department, I have never even seen this movie. I've only <laughs> seen clips here and there. But um, it's, it's kind of accurate and kind of not. But I'm not going to say it's totally inaccurate. Because health inspectors, the people that will be generally working with fairs and, and mass gatherings, they're going to be your environmental health scientists, of which I am one and have been one. It's a weird bunch. Um, <laughs> it's a great bunch, but, but it is pretty weird. And part of that comes from trying to balance the, the challenges of, of uh, regulating and educating. You know, if you want to keep businesses open, um, and yet you see sometimes where they're failing, sometimes on accident, sometimes on purpose. And, and so there, there is a, a challenge there um, uh, in, in 
portraying the right persona to, to get results and yet not alienate everybody that you're working with. Um, but, um, so, for someone that, that's putting on a fair temp temporary mass gathering, they, they, they kind of go hand in hand. They, most health departments will have one person designated to, to work in that area. Um, I don't, it may not be all that they do, but um, they will have some general special uh, training or, or just long time experience um, to help work through the issues that can come up with these types of events. Generally, we are here to help. Um, as I kind of went down across the state asking different health departments what um, advice they would give, is for any of these events, it's to, to bring the health department in early. Um, and it's maybe easier said than done, but uh, the earlier they come in, it, it, it really helps to um, smooth out some of the issues that can happen, as you probably well know, when we're trying to cr crunch a lot of uh, things in right at the last minute. Um, these are just, I don't even know why they're busy in there, but uh, in Southeast Utah, we actually do uh, grade our restaurants, but uh, that one got made, it's got a cockroach on there. Uh, <laughs> these guys hit their C by no cars, I, I like that. Um, but I, I, do, I do bring it up just as a reminder that um, we will do everything we can to educate people before we're going to shut them down. I, I, that, when people come to me a lot, they say, you know, they complain about something, they say, go shut them down. Um, you know, I, I ate here, I threw it, I threw up, I go shut them down. As a general rule, the people at the health department, that is not what we want to do. We want to promote good business, uh, but we want them to be healthy. We want these, these events to, to, to be successful. Um, um, and so, um, as part of that effort, um, you got to figure out what the process the county does in conjunction with the health department. We talk about, you know, in, in my area, I have the health department that is its own local government entity. Um, and then I have Grand, Emory, and Carbon counties. And they all approach these events a little bit differently. In, in Grand County, where we have, you know, starting basically the first week of March, we have a special event basically every weekend through the end of October. Now it's pushed into November. Start, you know, we've got these things you've heard about, Jeep Safari and, and car shows, and um, it just kind of goes on and on and on. So in Grand County, what we have done um, with them is they have a special events coordinator. Uh, they have, uh, you fill out the application online, and we have given them all the information that, that we want to get out of this uh, situation. Um, in terms of maps, safety, health, uh, food, uh, and they will issue all the relevant permits for us and then let us know what, what was issued, um, knowing that the applicants got the health department information because it's it part of this process. Um, in Carbon County, they will approach the county or city wherever they're gonna hold their event, and then they'll get sent around to a bunch of different uh, areas public works, health department, whatever it may be. Uh, and that's the way they want to do it. It's a little bit more burden on the uh, event organizer, um, but uh, and we're, we're actually trying to, to shift that to be an all-in-one shop. Because we feel like the Grand County model for us is, a, is a best pack, best practices. Um, but Carbon County's been slow to adopt that. Um, Emory County is coming along, but so, it's worth knowing not only how the health department approaches um, preparation for these events, but also how it works in conjunction with the, the required <coughs> county permits and licenses and things like that. Um, but um, if you applied for one of these before or if you're working with your health department, um, the, the application in these cases 
it's best if it's really long, and that sounds like a pain, but there are a whole lot of things that, that we're worried about, um, and, and if we can just kind of be pretty minute in, in, those, in those questions that we're asking, we feel like we can head off most of the problems again early on. Um, and we love maps. Um, uh, you can get, you know, we've got you know hand-drawn maps. We've got professionally done maps. Um, it, it helps to look at where, where you're parking, your your trash collection, your crowd control, all of that. Um, so I encourage maps from those that are that are coming to you, or if you're again. Uh, uh, preparing these things, getting these events ready, uh, a good map will help us understand what's going on um, really well. Um, so, in Utah there, there is a rule, it's a temporary mass gathering rule, and um, just as we look at that, one of those is a temporary mass gathering and one is not. Any ideas? This, by the way, on the right, this is the uh, largest collection of redheads in the world. In place in, U in the UK, last year, the year, maybe two years ago. I mean, we have a collection for everything. <laughs> so, um, from a health department point of view, from a rules point of view, this certainly is a mass of people and they're gathered for a little short amount of time. Out, it's, it's in a place that is intended for that purpose. So um, if you're bringing a lot of people into the fairgrounds and you, know, you have the facilities there to handle it, that's not a mass gathering per se. When you bring a lot of people in, there's no restrooms, there's no garbage collection, um, there's no water, things like that. That is temporary mass gathering. And, and in those instances, they always need a, a permit to do that. Um, and that's here. That's the rule that that describes these temporary mass gatherings. Um, of course, so if you're putting on a fair, obviously you don't need a permit for the fair per se. Um, but a lot of the principles that we're going to talk about apply to both of these situations. So R three ninety two four hundred is a good one to, to know. Um, so the, the definition of a temporary mass gathering involves a thousand or more people that will be there for two or more hours. Again, we talked about a site that is not designed for that purpose, really. Um, or if you are going to a fairground that's intended for 5,000 people and you're bringing 10 in, then that may be a temporary mass gathering as well. So you need some additional infrastructure body. <coughs> So the main purposes of that rule, and I think it, from the health department point of view, again, this is what we're looking for, is to protect, protect, preserve, promote health and safety of the public, prevent and control the incidence of communicable disease, reduce hazard, hazards to health and environment, maintain adequate sanitation and public health, and promote general welfare of the public. That is spelled out in that rule, and, and should be the approach that we all take as we're working with you or whoever is coming in. Um, so talking about the food aspect of it, um, it's great. Carbon County, they just have a fairly new fairgrounds and, and as part of that they, they put some commercial kitchens uh, in the rodeo stands and, and throughout. And there is the ability for people to rent those spaces out and come and prepare food and, and they do that and it, it's great. Um, more and more, we're seeing that it's a source of income for people to either have a food truck or a food cart. Um, but in either case, they need a permit for what they're doing. Uh, they need to know where their uh, health department will need to know where they're um, preparing their food. And I think it's worth it for the county to know as, as well. Um, <coughs> I, I mentioned they can go either way where that, is, that permit is issued. But uh, we talked about a little bit about this is not my word so much the liability issue. If there were to be some sort of an outbreak, a food borne disease outbreak, um, it protects everybody if there are the proper permits issued, um, as opposed to you know a food borne outbreak with an unlicensed food vendor 
they start to have a problem, the, the, the event organizers could potentially have a problem as well um, as a result of food being sold that we're, we're not aware of. <coughs> so, uh, these are just some clever food facts. My kids really like that truck Norris one. Not we haven't eaten there, but they like they like the day. The Berlinian Falcon. There's a lot of clever names <laughs> out there. Um, a lot of the uh, folks on the Wasatch Front have a lot more experience with food trucks than, than we do. Um, um, we only we only work with about ten separate food trucks. Whether they're um, a lot of them just stay in Grand County. Uh, but we do have the Waffle Log and a few others that come down to Carbon County. And we've, we've actually had a pretty good experience with them. I know that's not a universal sen sentiment, but because we um, know pretty much everyone that's coming down, we uh, are able to work with them over time and they've met our standards. As a whole though, I, I, I'm pretty positive that this is, the food truck movement um, is moving in a good direction as far as food safety. Uh, again, that's never going to be 100%, but um, we hold them to a high standard, and, and most of the time when they come into our county, we, we feel that they're, they're already meeting that standard. Um, so just so you're aware of uh, what's required of a food truck, um, if they are operating annually, um, they will need a primary permit from their county of origin, and then a secondary permit from whatever other counties they work in uh, and, and sell food in. The reason that is in place is in case we need to revoke that permit. Um, that may change in the coming year, coming legislative session. There's been some talk about that. Yeah? Do they, oh, I just thought temporary, do they issue a temporary permit just like for the fair? If there's a truck that doesn't, Yes, okay, exactly. So if you have that annual permit, um, you can come in, you, you may need additional approval from the fair, but as far as food goes, that covers your permit from, from the health department perspective. But if you don't do that annually, um, we issue 24 hour to 14 day temporary permits. Um, that's the, the whole range of Utah um, issues those types of permits and they're Generally, pretty inexpensive. Uh, Bill, um, I know in our area that, that we well, we don't issue it, but the county will issue it. It's a very tax ID number, um, and that goes up to 14 days. So I'm, I'm wandering back and forth a lot. Um, so we the the issue of Permits at, at food permits and at these events has long been under discussion, um, particularly as they're exploding. They're way more difficult for us to get to to inspect every one of them, just staffing wise, we don't have it. Even uh, the bigger counties are struggling to, to meet the needs on the weekends to get these inspected. Um, and there has been call before in Utah to just eliminate the licensing process. I won't highlight the county this came from, but uh, we had a county that was very strongly opposed to, this is, pro this is before my time even, but I heard it from the source, so uh, they were opposed to licensing, um, and then the uh, county commissioner went to a, a, a weekend event and their family got sick, um, and they quickly changed their tune. Uh, and that's not everybody's opinion, but that seems to be how it works in public health. That everyone ignores it until something bad happens. And we, we brought, uh, try to ramp up once again. Um, but uh, this this case is not that old. Um, we talked about another one um, in San Diego that happened earlier this year. Um, that does go through. Coolize him and salmonella, things like that, run through these types of events, whether it's for food or water or what, what have you. Uh, sewage is a very big deal. Um, 
And uh, this is probably before some race, everyone gets nervous. Um, this is a table from that rule I showed you earlier. You obviously don't need to read all that, but it, it just gives you um, how long you're going to be there, how many people, and it will tell you how many toilets you need. Um, so there are a lot of algorithms that go into that. You can find different things. More is always better. Um, but some considerations to, to um, keep in mind that we always want at least 5% of them to be accessible. Uh, uh, except accessible. If alcohol is served, then we um, increase that number by 40%. If you're going longer than 10 hours, then is that table only had up to 10 hours? Um, then there are some additional formulas that you can um, bring in to figure out how many more toilets you need. And hand washing stations. A lot of people are really used to ordering toilets and they forget about the hand washing stations. Want one for about every 10 toilets um, with soap and water. If in, in the terrible situation that soap and water is very difficult to come by, you can, with the approval of the health department, uh, just have sanitizer there. Um, uh, except in the case of food service, they always, always have to have soap and water available. But then one of the, the uh, issues that a lot of our health department partners have seen lately is just that the events are forgetting about garbage, collect garbage collection, particularly outside the porta potty areas. And so um, paper towels are, are overflowing and blowing around. Um, and it's not a fun experience for, for anybody. So they need a lot. You need to consider the weather. Are they, is the wind going to be a factor there or not? In fact, wind is always a factor with porta potties themselves. If it's going to be, as you look at the weather, it's going to be a little dicey. You want to have those porta potties mounted in a way that the weather won't blow them over, or they can be protected from vandalism, uh, pushed over, and things like that. Should have, should be 100 feet away from food service, but uh, not more than 300 feet away from the main gathering areas, and. Uh, um, they need to be emptied every every day or more often as needed. And off and a lot of times with a lot of our bigger events, it, it ends up being two to three times a day. And so uh, having a really good connection with that that porta potty contractor is is a must. Really, they they um, they are best friends in those instances. <laughs> and then after it's done, we have two days to get to get rid of them. Uh, again, that, that comes into, uh, we're starting to take our chances with weather, vandalism, things like that. Um, and you always want to make sure that, that the porta potties are in good condition, things like that. We, we all kind of know that. Drinking water. Um, so, there's a lot of people that sell water at these events, and they can do that, but every event like this has to have free drinking water, bottled water available. Um, and it should be, um, one thing that we've seen is that the organizers will have it available, but they will hide it. So that will kind of force people to buy the bottled water. And that is strongly discouraged just because there will be a lot of people that can't afford it or don't want to buy it. So there needs to be, needs to be well marked where, where the bottled water is. Um, you're going to haul it in, you want to make sure that the people hauling it in have the proper permits. It um, says bottled water on the side of their truck. If it's scratched out, that starts to be a little iffy. You can go from sewage. We have had someone go that hauled sewage and then put a little chlorine in there and tried to bring some water in, and that was not a good situation. We didn't, they didn't end up being able to drink or to give that out to pay for this. Um, but uh, the organizers of the health department, or you know, people with common sense may decide, you know, it's a lot, it's, it's hotter, this is an athletic event, whatever it may be, but we're going to up the requirements, um, the drinking water requirements as well. Um, in this vein, it's really good to know 
Um, this is something I forgot to put in here, but um, be aware of the hose bibs, the hoses that are around the area. Um, uh, hoses that are lying around in, in troughs or, or, or kiddie pools or whatever it may be become a very likely source of cross-contamination, backflow issues. Um, a lot of the hose bibs don't have proper backflow on them or and so people are, are hooking up um, that you may not be aware of, the organizers may not be aware of, and, and um, the hose may be just sitting on the ground, kind of laying in some dirty water, and then if there is a surge event, that gets sucked back in. And so having control of the hose bibs and, and just the, the, um, the faucets and things like that is, is a good thing. There may be legitimate reasons to, for people to access them, um, but we <coughs> want to know what's going on there. And if they are, if there are hose bibs around for um, for food trucks, for example, um, one thing we will be checking is that the hoses they use is, are food grade hoses. But um, we see it quite often in fairs. In, in an animal situation, the hose is just draped over the side of the drinking water trough. Um, it's turned on and off, but just hangs out there. And that's uh, asking for trouble. <coughs> um, it's required signage at every event. Pretty self explanatory. For, for, for safety issues, first aid issues in particular, um, it has to be well marked and, and easy to get to, and at the same time, they want that person that's undergoing uh, any potential first aid to, to be able to have some privacy. So it may be a matter of having some portable, portable screens or, or available, or something just to shield them until they, they get uh, further treatment or are taken away. Um, Needs to be accessible to first responders. And all uh, anyone that uh, is enacting in a medical role has to have a radio um, or have access to radios to call out for for backup. Um, and <clears throat> this is uh, the for temporary mass gatherings. Generally, it's required that, that medical personnel be on site at all times. Um, and that's, that can get expensive, so that's one that, that uh, organizers often try to get around. Um, and they've gone to the local fire chief, for, for example, and said, hey, if we call 911, will you come? Well, yeah, that's their job. Um, and they'll say, yeah, and so they, they figure they've met their requirement, but they, they haven't. Um, it, it's possible to waive that requirement, but again, that, Generally has to come from the health officer or his designated uh, employee. So animals. We heard a little bit about animals and disease. Um, it is what we ought to be worried about. Um, they're fun and cute. Um, this is a timeline of uh, individuals that um, contracted E. coli uh, after attending San Diego Fair. Um, uh, this purple line in the middle, uh, this is Zan, here's his picture, he died. Um, but uh, it wasn't immediately obvious uh, what was going on with these individuals. You know, uh, E. coli doesn't strike within six hours or 12 hours. You can see, if you read through there, A, the A circle is when they attended the fair. B is when they got the illness. So it's anywhere from two to four days after attending the fair. And then um, when public health got it, it was again probably five to seven days after that. So that's a little bit slow. But in each of these four cases, they, they confirmed that they did go into the petting zoo. Um, and it, um, They, they looked at the food sources. Um, this, each of these families had eaten at food booths at the fair, and they did a lot of sampling, and they did uh, both the food and the 
took swabs from the employees, got a dose, and didn't find any E. coli there. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know exactly what happened, I don't know, uh, but we do know that, um, let's see, here are some potential diseases that the animals would carry. It, it, um, yeah, some bacterial diseases up top, it was top uh, four. Um, we've got parasitic ones as well. Rabies would be really rare, but um, a possibility. E. coli is kind of the classic one. Salmonella would probably be the next most, but we kind of go back to you want to <coughs> get them sanitizer placed everywhere in your animals' homes. And a lot of signs reminding people to, uh, to wash and, and clean themselves. It's those that are five and younger that are uh, most at risk, um, not only because they're uh, not, their immune systems aren't quite fully developed, uh, but uh, of course they're the ones that are going to be touching and, and their hands are going to be around their face. And, that fecal oral transition will happen more readily for them. And so, you know, if there are little fences up so that you can kind of control what, what's going on, they're not stepping in the, the corrals and getting uh, feces and tracking that all around the fair, that's obviously a good practice. No food or drink should ever be in these areas. Soap and water and sanitizer. <coughs> If it were to come back to you that there, that uh, you know, as an organizer or as a, someone related to these events that you're starting to hear about disease, I'd encourage you to get public health involved as quickly as you can. Um, that is you know, what our epidemiology units are intended to do: is to go investigate as many possibilities as, as there may be and uh, narrow that down to what actually happened. In San Diego, you saw that. Uh, they, they shut down access to all the animals during that fair. Um, but um, he, E. coli uh, can lead to HUS hemolytic uremic syndrome, so his kidney is shut down. So he, he died. Pretty sad. Um, for me, I think that. Uh, Again, as you read this, it, you know it's kind of funny, and it's kind of true. We get knocked at the health department for sometimes being overprotective, overreactive. Um, it is with the best of intentions. It's good for our employees to interact with people outside of the health department, um, so that we don't get siloed into just knowing what we know, that we understand your perspective, the perspective of, of other organizers. Um, and uh, certainly we don't know everything, so we encourage you to ask questions, make suggestions. Um, we are able to implement a lot of positive change based on the recommend recommendations of outside sources. And those end up going into rule and, and benefiting everybody so that it's not just one health department that's, that's made that positive change. Um, I told you it would be fast. Uh, so just the takeaways that, that I came up from this is, is, oh, there is one other thing before we get into this. I, I thought about this on the way up that I forgot to put it in the presentation. Um, pay attention to, the, to this if you're bringing in sponsors to your event. Um, we had this happen this year where there was a tobacco company um, that uh, brought in some money to an event and um, it was needed. Um, unfortunately, that is, unfortunately, that is against Utah law to have these public events sponsored by tobacco companies. Um, and there are a few other things like that. So uh, make sure that whoever's bringing in money to your event is going to be displaying their name. Um, that that's okay, and again, 99% of the time it's going to be just fine, but tobacco companies in particular are becoming more creative about how they market, package their products and market their products, so that, that is one, one thing that 
be um, on the lookout for. So get to know the, the person that, that you'll be dealing with. Um, connect with them early and, and often, keep them in the loop. Um, both parties should learn from what's happened in the past. That's obviously a, a, a great um, resume builder in terms of uh, how we're going to approach these events in the future. I right, talked about asking questions and making suggestions. We, um, there's a, the CDC is um, pushing this new public health model, they call it Public Health 3.0, where we don't just sit in our uh, health departments and, and do the things we do, that we reach out more to our government partners, our community partners, uh, and we don't make unilateral decisions. We, we make them in conjunction with uh, those that we're living with and working with regularly. And I would, I would uh, indicate that this is a great opportunity to opt to uh, implement Public Health 3.0, where your input is valuable, and, and as a health department, we'll be more effective in what, in what we do if we partner with you. So that's that's all I've got. I didn't know if there were any questions.